Willkommen beim Wonderful Podcast. Living Yoga of the Mat. Ich bin Wanda Badwal. Ich freue mich, gemeinsam mit dir die faszinierende Welt des Yoga, der Spiritualität und persönlichen Weiterentwicklung zu erforschen. Zu hören und zu erfahren, wie wir mehr Liebe, Balance und Erfüllung in unserem täglichen Leben integrieren können. Willkommen bei Wonderful. Schön, dass du hier bist. Hi and welcome to a new episode of the wonderful podcast Living Yoga of the Mat. I'm so happy that you're here. This week I'm very honored and excited to introduce to you this week's guest Mark Whitwell. He is one of the most renowned yoga teachers around the world and who has lived and studied with the great teacher of all teachers Sri T Krishnamacharya and his son Desika Cha. Mark has truly studied yoga in his origin and his teachings are a great inspiration to me and to thousands of yogis around the world. He was born in New Zealand and began his yoga journey in the 70s and spent many years studying and teaching the tradition of yoga in India and Fiji. He has a non-profit organization called The Heart of Yoga. He teaches a path of yoga that is beyond any style and that is open to everyone who can breathe. He teaches a simple and yet profound yoga, which is accessible to everyone with no dogmatism, meeting the needs of the individual with compassion and a loving open heart. I'm honored to introduce to you the great Mark Whitwell. Enjoy. So welcome, Mark, to the podcast. I'm so grateful that you took the time in your busy schedule. You're right now on a Europe tour here. And yeah, thank you so much for coming in the podcast and taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you, my pleasure. So the first question I always like to ask my guests here in the podcast is, what is moving you right now in your life? My breath <laughs> and heartbeat hmm. and relationships of all kinds especially some people that I'm very close to. That's what moves me. Mm. Mm. And I move basically according to uh, these relationships, you know, like with you, a relationship that is developed and become um, dear and important, you know, mutual affection between two actual people, you know, And in that, I think there is uh, there is what is valuable in life. You know, there is in relationship there is transmission. In relationship, there is realization, like the literal realization that spirituality talks about. That it is in relationship that this happens. Relationship with our life in every way. So I am moved by relationships, like even being here in Europe right now. Um, I mean, I could be very comfortable on the beach, <laughs> you know, in the South Pacific. And it is very comfortable on the beach in the South <laughs> Pacific. Fiji or, or Bali is very nice too. You know, the weather is good. Um, and it is... Uh, due to m dear friends here in Europe who asked me to come and um, be here uh, with you and and also to teach what I know from my teachers. So I'm here because of that, you know, mm -hmm. because of relationship with my dear friends here in Europe. Mm. So that's what moves me. Mm. That's my answer. Thank you. Mm. So you also have been moving a lot through Europe yeah. recently. Yeah. You've been to Barcelona, you've been to Paris, to Manchester, mm -hmm. to Amsterdam, and now you're here in Munich. Mm -hmm. So what I was thinking about yesterday is you must have seen so many people in the last weeks and got an impression, what is the vibe in Europe right now? What is, what are, how are people doing? Like, what is your impression? I love coming to Europe because of the intelligence 
of the people I know in Europe. They are very bright, um, multilingual, egalitarian, you know, with a, a broad um, understanding of cultures and cultural differences and tolerance of different cultures. And, um, and very much a sense of um, the hierarchy, I say egalitarian, you know, people who live a life where everyone is obviously equal to everybody else or, you know, when the, the one life that is happening. The hierarchy diminished in this society of Europe that I move in anyway. I know it's not true altogether in the politics of Europe. I, you know, I'm not naive to what's going on in the, in your in your countries. But these people who are interested in yoga are very wonderful, and uh, I would say they are the hope of humanity actually. And it's these people who will be the teachers and the leaders like yourself a leader in this world uh, for future times you know in fact you actually wonder remind me of the prime minister of new zealand right now jacinda ardern a world leader who's just in her 30s and has a had a baby in office uh, the only second time it's ever happened, the first time was, was with Bhutto in Pakistan. And she got assassinated. So this world is terrible. Mm. But there is something happening with people actually being educated in, in the yogas and in uh, what is uh, the depth of uh, human wisdom culture, the depth of uh, what is uh, authentic uh, spiritual living. Mm -hmm. And this is bubbling through. And it's bubbling through in Europe and it's bubbling through in New Zealand and America, believe it or not. There is this. This is happening. And it is the hope for humanity. Mm -hmm. So I'm delighted to be in service to that. And what I want to see is this come through into the very broad public psyche, you know, the very broad public. And I mean the people who presently uh, do not have the benefit of this particular um, education right now. And th this is what I see you you are doing right now, it's like doing your best to communicate into the broad public what is life uh, practice, you know, what is intimacy with life, what is yoga, what is spiritual practice and all of this, what is a religious life, an authentic life, or what is an authentic life, that, uh, not necessarily in the framework, thought structures of uh, religious or spiritual mind, but yet still authentic, you know, how do we live? Mm -hmm. How do we enjoy our lives is the subject. And that we are busy, you are busy in communicating this into ever-increasing circles of the public. And this is what we have to do urgently. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <we're> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you so much mm. for, um, yeah, for, for communicating what you communicate, Mark. Mm. I mean... I know the, the benefits of yoga and how it transformed my life. But for people who are listening now and maybe never done yoga, mm -hmm. and so so why should people practice yoga? You know, you, you speak about it's a hope for humanity and for people who, you know, have less understanding yet about yoga and about the breath. So why is yoga actually working? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, yoga, if it is actually yoga, is intimacy with life. It is connection to life, to connection to what you are. And as you know, uh, this is not given to people broadly. 
his connection to life. People are um, conditioned to be useful to the productivities of society. Uh, you know, the productivities that are is causing us a chaos right now, literal chaos, you know, climate chaos, productivity. And people are conditioned to be productive, but not intimate with their own life, their own reality. So this is what yoga is. Yoga is that participation in the given reality, the power of this cosmos that is our life, that brought all life through and presently sustains the life in the vast harmonies of Mother Nature's ecologies, you know, and in the beauty that is life, that is everybody's condition. But sadly, as you can see, the public do not live like that. And there's an urgency to bring actual yoga into the public life and mind and understanding. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the reason to do yoga. And, you know, it's, it's a big subject, a can of worms, because yoga has been popularized as, as commercial activity. You know, it's been, <clears throat> the Americans got busy creating um, product, you know, brand style of yoga. Sorry, and um, I'll hold this closer. <laughs> and that has caused its own problem in popularizing something that is not actually yoga. It's more akin to uh, gymnastics or the fitness industry. And it's been um, <clears throat> co-opted by uh, every kind of um, marketing uh, need of fashion and products of all kinds and using the yoga demographic to sell stuff into, you know. So, you know, it's become, yoga has become a standardized product and commodity that's um, pushed on the public. And it's not all yoga. In fact, very little of it is. It is at best gymnastics or fitness or lifestyle, you know. And that's not what yoga is. Yoga is spiritual practice. Yoga is intimacy with life as it is, intimacy with reality as it is. And um, we must give that to the people mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. <laughs> so the people who are listening now, like the most direct way to practice yoga, you, you also speak about that a lot in your classes, is the breath. Mm -hmm. Right, so maybe we can take a deep breath together. Thank you. So on a very practical level, would you say like we can practice yoga by breathing more deeply? Yeah, it's a specific technology that we can learn. Um, I want to emphasize that this came in um, ancient wisdom culture, of humanity, uh, which was about each person's means, practical means, to enjoy the profundity of what life is, to enjoy the power that is every person's life, to enjoy the intelligence that is life arising, to enjoy the beauty that is everybody's condition in the vast harmonies of this body in the cosmos. This body is in life on earth is extraordinary harmonies of air and light and water in the green realm and male-female collaboration, which is the nurturing force of all life, you know, the source of all life. So this um, arrived uh, in a sort of an evolutionary process in the ancient world of this culture that we call Veda, you know. And um, it was given in non-hierarchical systems for people, mainly agricultural people, to enjoy the power of their own life. It has been so useful that it uh, survived 
thousands of years and it's come through and come through and then from about um, <clears throat> around about three or four hundred BC uh, with the invention of the written word it then came into text sacred text and so forth before that it was an oral tradition so it's in sacred text and what I want to say it is a specific thing mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a means of this participation in the power of my own life and the beauty of my own life uh, that anybody can do. It's a little different from some of the other aspects of uh, this powerful wisdom culture of Veda. Uh, and we can look to other cultures too. You could, you could go to say, you know, Hebrew, ancient wisdom, you know, and other... Islam and uh, Christian culture, you know, you could look into what is powerful, what is useful in these beautiful cultures. In the culture of Veda, there were other amazing transmission systems. For example, like music, like the ancient raga of we have some extraordinary exponents, of, you know, Ravi Shankar and his daughter and that whole lineage of amazing maestros. And you listen to their music and you fall into sublimity of your own reality in the power of raga, you know, in the rhythms and the melodies that were anciently evolved over thousands of years and then duplicated by very um, skilled people and very dedicated people who could do that. Or, say, the use of mantra um, and chanting of Veda. And, the, and these things take particular um, skill and cleverness to play Indian classical music. They say you're still a beginner after 20 years of playing eight hours a day in practice. You're still a beginner. And then after 20 years, then you can be somebody <laughs> who, can, who can deliver the, tr the transmission. What's about amazing about yoga is that it's not like that. You don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not a particular heroic skill. It's given immediately to anybody who wants to do it, and anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. And this is the great uh, gift from Krishnamacharya, the teacher of the teachers, where he said there's a right yoga for every person, no matter who the person is, that if you do this yoga, you will be participating in the power of the cosmos that is your own reality and the intelligence of life that is your own intelligence and the unspeakable beauty of life that is your own beauty. The beauty of Mother Nature is your own beauty because you are Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. You are the wild, your body, everybody's body. Your body is in perfect harmony with the entire cosmos for its own existence mm -hmm. and support and nurturing that is everybody's condition and this is a simple thing that was evolved in the ancient human world of participation in that mm -hmm. and it didn't require some heroic effort or extreme skill mm -hmm. like other transmission mechanisms did and it didn't require um, heroic work on yourself that only a few people could do to get to some presumed higher place called God or enlightenment. This whole thing happened later in Veda. This happened with the invention of spiritual doctrine and it coincided with the inv invention of the written word, you know, around four, 500 BC, where they turn spiritual information into instrument of power presumed to be held by special amazing people you know the the model of the perfect person turn this stuff into uh, doctrine and then into and yoga got mixed up with that you see that yoga was seen to be this extreme effort towards a future place called god or enlightenment that only a few amazing people could do. And that's that got turned into how the human life now thinks of itself. We all think that we're in 
you know, like where meat packages and the struggle to to become, you know, in some future place of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And yoga is mixed up with that. I just want to emphasize that yoga has nothing to do with that. Yoga is for everybody and is each person's real participation in the reality of their own existence. And it's not a struggle. It's mm -hmm. just a practice. Yeah, I love that. I think it's perhaps the most powerful message for people to hear that yoga is for everyone and that it's not about a struggle. Yeah, because we got mm. sold this idea. Mm. And I've been to your class yesterday and you call your class perfect yoga, no, advanced yoga for perfect beginners, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I love that because many people come to your classes, you know, being teachers themselves and all of this. I'm a teacher myself and I come there and your classes are, you know, you do simple, you simple things, right? Breath, breath, breathe in, breathe out, you know asanas classical asanas and it's so profound like the effect is very deep mm -hmm. and i'm i'm still amazed by it you know there's Thanks. no huge visualization or huge i don't know put your foot behind your head and twist around this direction mm -hmm. that direction with you know fancy music it's very <laughs> calm and very touching you Thanks. know very moving mm -hmm. and i think like the way you teach for me also as a teacher is very empowering um, to to strip down everything that is not necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you advise for teachers hearing that, like other yoga teachers, other yogis, for their own practice and their own teaching? What are the principles to keep, and also according to Krishnamacharya, that are necessary to actually have yeah. yoga there? Yeah. Well, I would say that these principles that you very kindly um, reflected on that for example, that I taught last night to you and your friends, uh, they are quite specific. That's what I mean about this is quite a specific technology that came through the great wisdom culture of Veda, these liberated free people who enjoyed the power of their own reality and complete intimacy with reality. That some people would call that God, you know, just a mm -hmm. reality the power of the cosmos that is arising as all things, all life. That skill of participation is anybody's capability. No matter what your age, your body type, your health, or your cultural background, you can do this. Right? But it is quite specific. And it may not seem like very fancy, like you know, you're talking about, <laughs> I love you visual, fancy visualizations with one foot behind your head and you know breathing through one nostril while you chanted <laughs> Gayatri Mantra. All this to loud, you know, sacred music in the back. All this that's been popularized in yoga, um, and much of it is sort of like a difficult attainment that some heroic people, some ath athletic people, have done and now they teach it, you know. None of that is the actual skill that I'm talking about. There's a specific um, body of practice adapted rightly to the needs of every person, no matter who they are, that, uh, that we need to bring through to our lives and to the public life. And that's what we practiced last night. And as you noticed, it is very empowering to one's life. But did you notice how easy it was to do that anybody in that group, no matter their age or health, could do? Mm -hmm. So in the language of Krishnamacharya, there's a right yoga for any, for every person, no matter who the person is. Uh, and he would say, if anyone who wants to do yoga can do yoga, and that is anybody can do it. He said, if you can breathe, you can do yoga. And that is each person's direct embrace of reality itself, the power of this cosmos that brought us here in the first place, that presently sustains us, nurtures us, mm -hmm. in the beauty that is reality, in the harmonies that is life on earth. So anybody can do 
um, but it's a specific thing. And sadly, what I've seen in this popularization of yoga, that specific thing that Krishnamacharya brought through from the great tradition in his scholarship, it's not there. Something else was popularized. <clears throat> so we need to get that through now. What was popularized was the bravado of young athletic men who set themselves up as teachers or gurus and um, strutted around and had themselves photographed. Uh, in the psychology of extreme attainment towards some future possibility, you know, the statement, practice and all is coming, you know, this idea of God, or, you know, your, your God realization. I love that, that you, you know, you, you reflected on that quote, mm. because I've never liked it. <laughs> it's a com it, no, it's a complete hoax. See, say, say all is coming is is the statement of an active denial of what you already are, as if something needs to come, as if I'm not already the power of God on earth or the power of the cosmos here in this skin, in this heartbeat, breath, this sex, this power that is my life. As if I have to uh, get somewhere else is the hoax that's been put on humanity. In so many forms, you know, just the the ordinary, you know, sort of world religions that civilization and political power structures have been built upon, all of that. But in in the Hindu cults and even in the popular ideas of yoga, is this mastery of some amazing kind of body feats or mental feats of mind gymnastics, you know, controlling the mind and all that nonsense, is now taught. As yoga, this idea of getting somewhere amazing is the act of denial of the amazement that is in front of us, that is, you know, you and me mm -hmm. and the sun. So when you say yoga is the direct embrace with reality itself, so I was reflecting on that like yesterday night when I was driving home and I was like, where does it start? Because for many people, the reality is not beautiful in that moment, mm -hmm. right? So where do we start with that embrace? Is it with self-love, radical acceptance, mm -hmm. like like on a very practical level on my everyday Well, life, I know what you, you know? mean. I just, there's no philosophy will do it, no affirmations of mind. What's required is intimacy with life. So anybody, and that is everybody who's suffering the imposition of mind on this beautiful body. The starting point is to lie them down and move and breathe and be intimate with your own body and breath. And if you're intimate with your own body and breath, this unitary movement of body and breath, what happens is the mind automatically follows the breath. So therefore the mind becomes linked to this whole body, which is the beauty of the cosmos. <laughs> so just, you know, we don't have to make philosophy or give religious ideas or spiritual ideas. It's just be with somebody and have them experience the beauty of their own breath. You know, the body loves its breath, and the inhale loves the exhale, like literally. And when people experience that for the first time, who have not been given this in their life, no matter what their age is, they might be a teenager or they might be 85, <clears throat> and whoever they are, when they given this specific technology of yoga from the Veda, as it was brought through by this great scholar, Krishnamacharya, the teacher of our teachers, gives them that. And then there's something that they feel that's different from oh, reality is, reality sucks. <laughs> reality is stress. Reality is, it, you know, life isn't fair. Politics isn't fair. Business isn't fair. It's not fair how this society is functioning and this dreadful, stressful struggle that we 
all are involved in just to survive, you know, while we pollute the planet with our overproduction and our fossil fuels and all the rest of the story that we're in, you know. So life is not that, you know, I talk about capital R reality and small r reality. Mm -hmm. And to go to the capital R reality that I am life on earth, that's what I am. And to experience life on earth as it is, uh, then I can do better with the small r reality, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I can start coping with my relationships and my my um, career and my money and you know, making contributions to society in a way that I feel better about rather than just being bombarded by things that I have to react to. You know, I start to master my own experience. If you start with the body and breath and there's a possibility of then being intimate with all other aspects of life and moving into career and money and and the, the the functions that we all must participate in life to survive, to have families and survive, you know. We must, but we can do it as a matter of um, intimate connection to our body, breath, and relationship in that order. You know, my intimacy with my body, my breath, to my work life, to my work colleagues, you know, as life itself. And then I can start to um, digest my experience do better with the difficulties of stressful things happening all around me. Mm. So the, sta the starting point is a little practice of moving and breathing in a way that's right for each person, their age and their health. That's what gets us in contact with that capital R, the big mm -hmm. reality that you cannot lose. It's always there. You're born into it as it. My teacher used to say, nobody need give this to you because you are it. You don't have to get it from some, you know, high-born priest with exclusive access. You know, it's, it's already your birthright. There's no spiritual power structure that you need to go to to get this from, no special place you need to get it from. You know, you already have it. And he'd say, and nobody can take it away from you. Wow, that's a that's a radical thought. Nobody doesn't matter what happens. You are the wonder of existence. Existence is your own fact, and it is profound, it, and it is eternal. It's been you know we've been billions of years of evolution going on to bring these bodies into existence, and here we sit. How did we get here? Well, it's taken billions of years mm -hmm. to be here. And we'll leave something, these bodies will leave some, an imprint on eternity that will have some reverberating effect for future, many, many future generations. This is why this dialogue is so important. Mm -hmm. We must do this for this generation and for all future generations. And even our ancestors are pleased. You come through and if Wanda, you have victory in your life. If you live your own beauty, your own power, your own breath and sex, you know, your own intimacy with life in the natural forms of life, then your ancestors who were deprived of that and had and dreadful suffering. You know. I mean, maybe your living ancestor, like your mother, your grandmother, grandfather, father to see your success as a, a person intimate with life itself they see you and they go wow thank god she came through you know we didn't have it mm -hmm. but she's and i'm saying that we are the first generation that can actually do this this dialogue was not there mm -hmm. with our parents or our parents but you know God damn it, what was going on in Europe, in this world, that could still potentially go on in this insanity of no intimacy in the human condition, patterned mm. existence, pattern, structured mind, you know, imposed on the body. Right? The, you are the first generation 
that can be finished with that, truly finished. And there is this idea, you know, in spirit-based cultures, that the ancestors are still there and they're cheering you on, like, you go, girl, you know, you, you do it for us. We couldn't do it, but you're doing it. <sighs> Thank God, you know. And then all future generations. Mm. So this yoga, you know, I'd say yoga is so undervalued. The asana is so undervalued. I, I call it, this yoga is the primordial religious practice of humanity, direct intimacy with reality, capital R reality itself, the power of this cosmos that brought us here in the first place and presently sustains us, body, breath, sex, mind, perceivers, you know, in this these profound harmonies of light and air and everything that we have here, you know. These yogas are the primordial participation in that. That's what it is. Um, that later got turned into the utterance of yogis, got turned into religious spiritual text that became doctrine, that became the tr controlling mechanism of institutional life, political life. You know, the utterance of great yogis like Christ or Buddha, you know, their their beauty was put into language, text, and then used hundreds of years after their life. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry, Rome co-opted the teachings of Christ and turned it into doctrinal systems mm -hmm. and stripped yoga, the primordial means of intimacy with life, with God, mm -hmm. stripped out of it, and all you had was meaning and then the arbitrary struggle and the thought structures of trying to get to this these amazing places that the that the scripture proposed. Mm -hmm. So there must be a yoga. And I mean no disrespect to the beautiful liturgy of people's religious life, like you know, Christianity and Islam and Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism. These are profound cultures with profound transmission in them. It's just that, and I quote my teacher, Krishnamacharya, who's a great religious scholar, it's just that there must be yoga in these sacred systems as the practical means by which people actualize the beautiful ideals of their faith. There must be yoga. So I'm speaking of this yoga for every person. Mm -hmm. Every person must be given these as their practical means. I was in the Notre Dame before it burned, and I could see the beauty there, you know, the empowerment that was being received by beautiful congregation of very sincere people. They touched me deeply, you know, see a, a middle-aged woman with her elderly mother going in there, the faithful going in and receiving something, you know, and it touched me deeply. But there was also a um, sort of a despair there. If great faith, but it's just like something was missing. That's all. And I, I wanted to like show these folk: inhale, exhale, move and breathe, whole body prayer to Christ whole body prayer to life, to whole body prayer to God, mm. uh, the yogas of participation that were there before even uh, Christ walked the earth, you know, as the practical means by which all people actualize the beautiful ideals of their faith. And yoga was there way back. And I would like to give these beautiful people going to the churches of Europe whole body prayer to God, whole body participation in God. So it's no longer just um, temple religion or you know superstitious religion of having you know appealing to a higher source. you know uh, you know help me, help me, help me, but participating in that higher source, this yoga becomes, I mean religion becomes uh, participatory, whole body, 
life in every way, participation in reality, in God, in Christ, like that. So it needs to be there. It needs to come in. And we're going to put it in there. Thanks for helping. <laughs> yeah, I, I love this idea to, to have yoga actually in church. I think it would be amazing if we have yoga churches all around the world. <laughs> and the churches that, um, and the mosques. And by the way, you know, Islam is the most, in terms of world religion, Islam is is uh, the most yogic in its um, practices, is, you know, five times a day. They do sun salutation, right? They yeah, it is It is like that, you know. Yeah. I'm, I've had a beautiful experience in, in teaching the, the principles of inhale, exhale, above to below, and put that into the Islamic uh, prayer cycle. And the people who did it in Palestine said, like, wow, our religion actually is a religion of love. Because they experienced it as um, as a, a personal practice, you know, me and God, mm -hmm. you know, not a rote practice, not just a social behavior, but a personal depth of feeling to their God, mm -hmm. no, to God, <laughs> to life, to reality. So um, it's a very helpful thing to all people, this yoga. <laughs> yes, it definitely is. Um, so you had the, I don't know if it's its luck, but you, you've um, come to be there um, with Krishnamacharya and you were his student for many years. You lived in India. Um, I think the Beatles called you there. You said that. What is your favorite Beatles song, by the way? Oh, my God. <laughs> There's so many. It would have to be Across the Universe, probably. Across the Universe? Yeah. No, but you can't deny the Beatles. It's all wonderful. I love them. <laughs> They're all-time favorites. It's all wonderful. And they, these songs are worthy of serious listening to again and again. <laughs> There's something happened on Mother Earth where the Beatles broke through and the girls started screaming. It was, a, it was an explosion of consciousness. It was a life celebration, you know. And while the thing of uh, particularly John Lennon and, and George Harrison uh, being personal and their, you know, being willing to communicate their personal journeys and their discoveries and their spiritual interests and meditation and all this. It, um, it put yoga on the map. It put Eastern uh, spiritual thinking into the West. And it was a beautiful thing that happened. And it's certainly, you know, the Beatles, hearing Beatles and knowing that they'd gone to India, that was of interest to me. It certainly got me moving along in that investigation. So so they inspired you to go to India. And I would love to hear a little bit about your relationship because you, you spoke a lot about relationship and intimacy, what I really love this mm. word, with life and also intimacy in relationships. And I think the most intimate relationship you can have is this with a teacher, right? So how, or tell us a little bit about your relationship with Krishna Krishnacharya. Right. right. Um, well, I would like to say it is simply a relationship with life. That's all. Is yoga is your, you know, starting with your own body and breath. There may not be successful relationships within the family, for example, and often there isn't. And there may not be a teacher that you can trust. What else? And there may not be an intimate partner, you know. It, you know, this is the reality. And you can't sort of like go out and like find that necessarily because this world is so dysfunctional, you know. But what you can do is move and breathe and be in your own life, be in your own body. Now, if you can find somebody, you know, like yourself in society and like 
you know, say my good friend Sibylla, who runs Heart of Yoga in Mainz in Germany, um, such a person who can, who you know, you can have some trust in that person that they know something that can be helpful to you. And you go to that person and this person shows you some yoga that you can do that makes you feel better in the midst of this dreadful suffering world where you don't feel connected and you don't know who you can depend upon. And maybe even in your own family, you know, forgive them because they were given a shoddy deal that they were born into, you know, so they troubled people, even our parents, you know, sometimes. So you find a teacher like yourself or like Sibylla, you know, and this person obviously cares about you and doesn't have just an agenda to get followers or create a yoga business or some nonsense, but, you know, like a sincere person. And that spend some time with that person and they give you a useful practice that connects your body, mind and breath into a unitary movement. Body, breath and mind is a unitary movement. And you do this practice and you go, I feel better. I feel better and I feel better. Feel life better, you know. And then you, this person is like somebody that you you develop a trust with. So it's it's trust in life that congruent with the trust in the person who's helped you, you know. And then in having trust in life, then you can uh, have a, a better orientation to your family, you know, your parents. You can start to perhaps forgive them because they were dished up a shoddy deal in very limited conditions in society, you know, and forgive them like that. Maybe even love them, even if they had, you know, serious limits in their life. Like that, you know. And then the matter of intimacy with somebody else, you know, that might become a personal intimacy with life, you know, you develop a little trust to be able to receive somebody, to give to somebody while synchronistically receiving them, which is what the yoga of breath is. It's to, it is strength, exhale to receive, inhale, strength that is receiving. So it somewhat, you know, changes the conditioning on the body that we're otherwise being born into. And it gives us the capability of becoming receptive of somebody else while giving to somebody else and you you know the magic that I'm talking about there. So this teacher relationship can be very helpful in all relationships. And the teacher relationship certainly doesn't replace relationships of every other kind. This is not a teacher. Anyone, you know, having some sort of um, exclusive connection to some, you know, guru or Pope or priest or somebody that is somehow um, a replacement or a substitute for a relationship with um, an intimate romantic connection to somebody else is this is not useful. This t connection to your own body and breath that your teacher has given you helps you be connected to all aspects of life, including your family and friends, and work colleagues, and the sun and moon, and everything in the natural world. So I conclude with this, is that in the, this ancient culture of Veda, uh, God and the deity, and your guru, and your spouse, and your body, and the entire elemental world of the body, the seen and unseen conditions of the cosmos, are all one. And we love them all. Not a hierarchy. It's not like there's the Holy Father and my, my biological father is less than that. See, that's the problem. As if my father, actual biological father, is somehow not as holy as the so-called Holy Father. That's the problem of human life. They've taken actual intimacy out of life by offering the perfect person, the the 
exclusive agency to a God life through an exclusive person or institution or priesthood. This is not useful to human life. The teacher is not that kind of uh, phenomena. The teacher is no more than a friend and no less than a friend. A teacher is an equal person. The teacher is not creating followers. In this Veda culture, the teacher never created followers. The guru is not there for his or her um, continuity, you know, name or fame, success. The teaching, the guru function was there for the moksha of the shersha, the guru shersha, the student shersha. The guru was there for the liberation of the student. When that liberation occurred, then the guru function dissolved. It wasn't needed anymore. There might be lifelong gratitude, you know, this person helped me, wow, thanks so much, but it's not something that is creating institution or continuity. In fact, the guru is no more than a friend and no less than a friend. This must be clearly understood what that means. You know, maybe not, you know, personal, actual, you know, living in your house friend, but definitely friend, capital F, you know, friendly, caring, concerned for a person's well-being, you know. And that's the nature of that relationship. The guru, no more than a friend, no less than a friend, in, um, in local community. Not a social identity, not a personal identity. Not, a, you know, not an egoic, individuated idea of who I am, you know. It is simply the force of nurturing of Mother Nature in local community. And that was always there in human society. It got reduced, uh, taken on, you know, usurped by uh, religious institution and people who would create their personal and social identity about being a teacher or a guru or a priest. And that's when all this nonsense started. And we've had that in the West in recent times of people calling themselves gurus and creating hierarchy and controlling. Yeah, it's usually fearful people who, um, who become teachers and they use their teaching function to control their social circumstance so they don't have to become vulnerable, you see. Mm -hmm. And these are the people who become teachers. There's a whole pathology around people who want to be teachers, including yoga teachers, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> you know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's there. But, you know, everybody's forgivable because there's no understanding of what is yoga and how there's this necessity for non-hierarchical. And, you know, finally, um, in human culture, the principal means of transmission is this actual affection between two actual people mm -hmm. you know like i care for you you care for me that's it mm -hmm. and in that something can be given that you know then we can give the you know the asana that's right for the person and help help a person practice intimate connection to their life through asana and then intimate connection to all other aspects of their life you know this this is this teacher function can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And so by the way, I found my teachers to be such people. You know, and you know Krishnamacharya, he was such a person. He was a humble human being. He he actually had a statement whoever says he is a guru is not a guru. If you say you're a guru, that means you're not a guru. Mm -hmm. There's no identity around it. If you say you're a yogi, you're not a yogi. No identity. It's just the force of Mother Nature that is all life, you know. So there's, there can't be an identity around it. So he was like that, and his son Desikachar was like that too. And if there was any um, temptation for them to make spiritual business out of being these powerful teachers with yoga, um, there were the Krishnamurtis there who they were very close to as personal friends. And like Jay Krishnamurti, for example, told my teacher Desikacha, don't you become one more monkey. <laughs> don't become a guru. Don't just do this patterning on society. 
don't teach the duplication of patterns in this world. And he was, there is a very important relationship for Desikachar from both uh, U.G. Krishnamurti and J. Krishnamurti. So they helped uh, level the playing field like that and to make sure that that didn't arise again. And it can't arise again in our culture. We've had enough experimentation with that. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We've had it in the old world religions. It doesn't work. We've had lots of experience of all kinds of new age gurus coming along in America and in India and teaching all the and creating little power structures, you know. Well, my teacher called it the social dynamic of disempowerment, mm -hmm. where somebody special is on a stage, maybe special clothes, and they're saying special things. They always have groovy, charming things to say, but they create this dynamic of the audience sitting there trying to get it. Something just beeped at us. Something beeped at us. Was that? Uh, oh, I think it's fine. Yeah, still recording. So, so yeah, this doesn't work. That's why I say the teacher is no more than a friend, no less than a friend. It's an equal, mutual affection between actual people, where there is no hierarchical system going on. The you know the bottom line is that what this body knows is what your body knows. You are life. I am life. The secrets of the universe are in you, and they're in me. And that's the end of the story. You know, here the, in yoga, there's some tools that I can share with you from my own experience that I've used myself, and I can adapt them to your needs, your body type, your age and health, and to your culture, and great respect to your culture and so forth. And like we were talking about Christians before, uh, Islamic people, for example, put these yogas must be put into their systems of feeling life and thinking about life. A great adaptation, but just sharing some tools, not setting up a hierarchy mm -hmm. where I'm somehow some spiritual authority. This thing is just absurd. Mm -hmm. It is just the problem of humanity itself. And, and yet, Mark, I also think it's so important to have teachers, right? Some people who guide us. Mm -hmm. way and to open up doors for us so for the people who listen now and i get this question quite often how can i find a teacher for me mm -hmm. it's a beautiful question and you know when my teacher Deska was asked that he had a simple answer he said you have to be lucky <laughs> you know and i reflected on that a lot to Deska you see who was son of Krishnamacharya, and Desikachar died just last year. He was a great, brilliant man. And so he was asked this question, how do I find a good teacher? He said, you have to be lucky. Now, you can trans translate that into a more um, sort of religious language of India. And what they say is, in, they say in Veda, how do you find a teacher? It is grace. That's all. Uh, you are graced with the certainty of um, something that is uh, right for you and true for you. And it can't happen any other way. But, you know, in the whole um, scene of people pretending to be, you know, fearful, deluded men, and sometimes women mm -hmm. playing the patriarchal game, of be, being uh, not willing to get off that pedestal, uh, you know, and be not willing to be ordinary people and equal to everybody else, just sharing their their uh, knowledge of yoga and their experience of yoga, not creating a seniority from it, you know. Um, Deskachar would say, always hold the teacher at arm's length until you know that they are ordinary people who, are, who do not have an agenda to put on you. Mm. This is a really important thing. You know. So in this world of teachings yes. where hierarchy is being established and then there's another absurd thing going on where people talk about, you know, we are, 
I'm not a guru, but they're behaving like a guru and with special chairs, special clothes, special behaviors, special income, you know. But they're, they've they got the teaching of no teaching, you know, that we're all, in this, you know, the non-dualist teacher. And it's kind of a popular thing now that's gone around the world, has its roots in, um, in Advaita Vedanta. But, you know, it's got to be understood that if that if there's still that social dynamic of the special person, then it's creating the disempowerment of the audience, and you've got to walk out of that system. So always hold the teacher at arm's length until you know that it is simply a friendship, that everybody is equal in that friendship. And there's no system of um, seniority or authority, you know. And it's almost impossible to imagine that because of our um, social conditioning and the way, you know, civilization has been created. We we simply, it's an axiom of social mind that there's somebody above you and there's somebody below you. Mm -hmm. And that's how civilization is working. It's how business is working. It's how politics is, how religion is working. It's how yoga is working. And it's the problem itself. It's a fault of culture. Yeah, you really look into it. The fact is that um, you cannot be second to anybody or anything because you're the power of the cosmos. And you cannot be superior to anybody or anything. That's a fact. The idea of a chain of being, there being somebody above you, somebody below you, is a social contrivance that um, Europe was built upon. In, the, in Asia, too, they have their own version. And for yoga to begin, we've got to see through that hoax and be finished with it. And, he, and then even not not be in reaction to it. We don't have to have a fight with anybody. And just be kind to everybody who's still under that presumption. But do communicate what you feel you know so no i want to quote uh, a aboriginal man i met in western australia and he said some of us decide to become christians but for those of us who become christians well he said jesus christ he's not the boss of us he's one of us so i knew then and you know for in authentic culture the spiritual transmission does not happen with this presumption of hierarchy, of seniority or authority. If it's there, it's not going to work. And you've got to see it, no matter how charming the teacher is, and be finished with it. Because it puts you in a psychology of, you know, you are less and you have to become more, you know, with some arbitrary discipline or method you know, become celibate or have a lot of exaggerated sex, whatever the nonsense is that people are selling, you know, one way or the other, and you know, or do these dramatic gymnastics on yourself until your body wears out, whatever they sell. You know, back to the statement, you know, practice and all is coming. It's something to be thought about really carefully. Hmm. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I could sit here forever and just listen to you and your wise words and your experiences you've gained. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um, unfortunately, we have to come to an end um, for today. And I have one last question I like to ask you, and it's a question from a book. And the question is, tell me, my friend, my friend what do you intend to do with this one wild and precious life. Mm. Embrace it. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's my answer. Mm. Embrace it. Because it is love. It is the cosmos. You know. And yoga is the means to do that. I cannot embrace it as some sort of ideal. I can't do that if I don't have these this basic yoga of participation in my actual embodiment my actual life you know so this is what my answer is to embrace the wild of mother nature that is my own condition that's what i do with it 
<laughs> Thank you so and much. And to wind this up, I just from this talk together, I do encourage people to seek out, you know, this this yoga, the heart of yoga, and how to do an actual practice that's right for each person, and do it uh, in your own house, uh, and do it without a drama. Don't do it obsessively. Do it actually and naturally, daily, non-obsessively in your own house. And we have an app, you know, I Promise app and the, the Yoga Promise app and online courses and so forth. And really good teachers here and there. And find this person and um, just start a simple practice and see what happens. Mm -hmm. That's what I recommend out of this meeting, this, this dialogue. Yeah. Yes, thank you so, so much for your time mark and um, if you're interested to practice with mark in person where can people find you in bali once in a yeah, while the, our website is heartofyoga.com mm -hmm. uh, heartofyoga.com and we have various events around the world and um, teacher training in bali and fiji and different places yeah yeah great so everybody's welcome and here in germany in mines once a year mm -hmm. Beautiful. So make sure that you sign up on Mark's newsletter so you get informed about all the awesome. future events. And we will also post um, the website and the links. Mark has also uh, written some beautiful books. And um, so make sure to have a look into that. And thank you so much for listening today. Have a beautiful day, guys. Bye bye. See Thanks, you next time. Thank you. Vielen Dank fürs Einschalten und Zuhören. Wenn dir diese Folge gefallen hat, freue ich mich, wenn du auch nächste Woche wieder mit dabei bist. Finde alle Infos zum Podcast unter www.wanderbadwal.com, Spotify, Apple Podcast oder deiner lieblings plattform Ich freue mich, wenn du mir folgst, den Podcast mit deinen Freunden teilst und eine positive Bewertung darlässt. Denn nur mit deiner Unterstützung kann der Podcast wachsen und so viele Menschen wie möglich inspirieren. Danke, dass du dabei warst. Ich wünsche dir eine wundervolle Zeit und wir hören uns nächste Woche. Namaste.